Welcome everyone. My name is Allison Jones. On behalf of Canadian Nuclear Laboratories and our supporting partners, Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, Health Canada and the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, thank you for joining us today. We're really excited to have Kevin Priest present today as part of our low dose radiation webinar series. The goal of our series is to help strengthen connection within the research community, and we're doing this by engaging world leading researchers pertaining to the effects of low dose radiation from different sources. If you've joined us before, you'll know that we aim to have some time um, following each presentation to answer any questions. So please feel free to use the Q&A function you'll see on your screen to write in these questions for Dr. Priest. Um, and to make a formal introduction, I am now going to hand it over to Edward Azam. Thank you, Alison. Greetings to everyone and welcome to CNL's Low Dose Radiation Research Webinar. Today, it is my distinct honor to introduce Professor Kevin Price, a gentleman and the pillar of the radiation research community, one who has made seminal contributions to basic understanding of the biophysical aspects of the radiation response, who made contributions to radiation protection and radiotherapy, he is a friend and colleague to many in this distinguished audience, one who has been always there to advance the research programs of others. Now, uh, Kevin is a professor of radiation biology at Queen's University Belfast in the UK. He is a leader, leader of the advanced radiotherapy group at his university. He completed his doctoral studies at uh, Aberdeen University in Scotland and received his postdoctoral training under giants in the field, including Jack Fowler, Julie Dennekamp, and Jed Adams. He is also of over 280 peer-reviewed and impactful papers that are highly cited. Kevin has held uh, uh, important uh, positions in the past. He was deputy director of the Center for Cancer Research and Cell Biology at Queen's University, and he was head of the Cell and Molecular Radiation Biology Group at the Great Cancer Institute in London, as well as editor-in-chief of the British Journal of Radiology. Early on in his career, Kevin has received many prestigious awards, including the Michael Fry Award of the Radiation Research Society in the US, the Frederick D. Sauer Award from the German Radiation Research Society. He was the, the Douglas Lee Lecturer at the meeting of the UK Institute of Physics and Engineering in Medicine. He received the Back and Alexander Award from the European Radiation Research Society. He is a fellow of the Radiation Research Society as in recognition to his many services to the radiation research community. He is an honorary, honorary member of the Royal College of Radiologists in the UK. Kevin's uh, Kevin's service is uh, exemplary. He is past president of the Radiation Research Society. Under his leadership, the society spearheaded, he spearheaded key activities that led to the expansion of the society's work and the integration of the field of epidemiology as a discipline of the society. Kevin contributes to the training of radiology residents in Europe, in his home country, in the UK, as well as internationally. In India, in Malaysia, he has an illustrious service to the community of radiation researchers internationally. He has been chair and member of the program committees of numerous national 
and international meetings on radiation research, radiation oncology. He has been member of numerous scientific advisory and editorial boards and uh, clearly uh, international and national grant review panels seek his expertise. Uh, Kevin is a leader in many aspects of radiation research. He contributed uh, in a major way to cell and tissue responses to low doses, low frequencies of radiation, the application of microbeam technologies. He uh, contributed to translational radiation biology as well as the optimizing of advanced radiotherapies. And currently, he leads major efforts in radionuclide therapeutic approaches. Kevin has been a mentor to over 60 doctoral students and numerous postdoctoral fellows, uh, master and undergraduate students who are now have their own laboratories and training the next generation of radiation scientists. Most import, uh, importantly as well, it is his seminal work on non-DNA targeted effects of radiation that contributed to paradigm shifts in our understanding of cell and tissue responses to radiation exposure. Today, we are fortunate that Kevin has taken the time to share with us his findings and thoughts on understanding the spatial and temporal effects of low dose radiation effects. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for taking the time to share with us your thoughts. Well, thank you very much, Edward, for that re really generous uh, introduction. And it's a great pleasure to be able to uh, speak to you today. Uh, let me just share my screen. My Yep, looks good. Can you see that? Excellent. OK, so today I'm going to talk about uh, um, understanding spatial and temporal aspects of low dose uh, radiation effects. Uh, and I'm going to cover several different aspects of that, looking back at, at some of the work we've done in this area uh, over the years. We're going to remind ourselves about some of the fundamentals of radiation tracks and how they interact with cells at low dose. Uh, we're going to look at how microbeams uh, have really been used for taking forward our understanding of the effects of individual ions uh, and focus a little bit on, on non-targeted effects and specifically bystander effects and particularly the role of non-target nuclear targets more generally. And then I'm going to finish off by saying a little bit about the importance of spatial distributions at the tissue level. Uh, and finally, uh, if there's time, a little bit about the role of the immune system. So as a, a radiation biologist, one of the things that uh, I'm challenged with uh, every day in my research career is really trying to understand radiation in all its different facets, whether that's low dose background exposures right through to large treatments of radiation doses that are given during therapy. So this is a large dynamic range of, of doses here. Uh, and to, as a radiation biologist, we need to understand the consequences of those uh, exposures uh, for the human population uh, and the relevance of that, for example, in using uh, radiation based sources uh, for therapy. So we have to understand radiation effects over a wide range of doses uh, and also um, critically, although I'm not going to cover that today, dose rates as well. In terms of radiation risk, of course, mo most of our understanding has come from exposed populations, predominantly high dose exposures, uh, such as the A-bomb survivors, radon miners, some medical exposures. Uh, but more and more uh, population uh, scenarios uh, are coming forward, which allow us to try and understand the effects uh, of radiation exposures to the human population. But to be more genetic about that and to be able to make predictions of that, we really need to be able to do experimental studies and try and make predictions of what the likely risks are likely to be. 
And currently our understanding is based on the LNT model, the linear no threshold model that really takes the A-bomb survival data, assumes a linear extrapolation between cancer risk uh, and dose, uh, and that's what's used in all intents and purposes for radiation protection. But however, at the low dose region down here, there's significant uncertainty in terms of the likely dose response relationships. And that's really because of a, a lack of a, a data of reasonable quality of exposed populations under these conditions and a lack of mechanistic understanding of what really drives uh, radiation carcinogenesis at low doses. And this is particularly important when you think about this in terms of the level of exposure, at the level of individual radiation tracks. What we're really dealing with here are non-homogeneous exposures. For low-dose background radiation, it's the spatial distribution of individual radiation tracks at the cellular level that are likely to be important. Whereas if we go up to other scenarios, such as accidental medical and therapeutic exposures, more and more we need to be considering the role of tissue, organ and whole body responses. And underpinning that is the need to understand the impact of different types of radiation, or what we call radiation quality, and also dose rate. So let's just remind ourselves a little bit quickly about the fundamentals of radiation tracts and how they interact with cells at low dose. Well, this is my genetic. Uh, human cell here could be in the order of about 20 microns across and we're going to put a, an energetic x-ray track through that and that track will interact with that cell and deposit individual ionizations and excitations as it crosses that cell and those will be randomly deposited in the nucleus of the cell interacting with the DNA and also the cytoplasm. And a single track from an energetic x-ray will deposit in the order of about one milligray Per cell. And as you increase the dose, essentially, and that would give about, uh, sorry, around about 100 ionizations per cell. And as you increase the radiation dose, essentially what you're doing is overlapping more and more of these tracks. So typically for a, a standard dose of one gray, you're, you're talking about a thousand radiation tracks crossing the cell. And essentially to all intents and purposes, with that 100,000 100, ionizations that you're giving there, you're giving a, essentially bathing the cell in series of ionization and excitation events throughout the cell constituents. Now that's the situation for an energetic X-ray exposure. Not all radiations are the same. And let's now consider the uh, energy deposition from uh, an alpha particle uh, across the same uh, representative human cell. A single alpha particle produces deposits its energy in a much more uh, distinct way. The ionization and excitation events are much more closely packed together as the radiation track crosses the cell. So for a single alpha particle track for a typical human cell, we're talking the order of about 250 milligray per cell. So if we can, and that deposits about 25,000 ionizations. So if we consider the concentration uh, situation of a dose of one gray, we're actually talking about three to four individual alpha particle tracks interacting with that cell. And you can see that the spatial distribution of that dose is completely different here from the alpha particles relative to the X-rays. So track structure matters and it has an impact on distribution and the way that dose is distributed at the subcellular level. And all of that impacts on how these tracks interact with the DNA and particularly the production of DNA damage, which we know is the critical uh, output from radiation exposure of the cell nucleus. For high energy X-ray tracks, these produce sparse ionization and excitation events, but nevertheless, there's a certain probability that they will interact with the helix of the DNA and some probability that they'll produce a double strand break. And we know that cells have difficulty in repairing these double strand breaks. And if they can't repair that double strand break, they will not survive that radiation exposure. For more densely ionizing radiations, such as alpha particles, um, as we've seen already, the, sorry, the tracks are much more densely uh, ionizing, individual ionization and excitation events more closely packed together. And that leads to much more complex a production of damage at the level of the DNA and more probability of what we call a complex double strand break being produced. 
these complex double strand brakes are much harder uh, for cells to repair. So there's a direct consequence of that a difference in track structure with the probability of that cell to repair that damage and survive that radiation exposure. So not all double strand brakes are the same. And in fact, we've known this for many, many uh, years. Uh, this was work I did many years ago, uh, and it's just an example of a lot of studies in the literature showing that with the increasing ionization density for different types of radiation exposures here, there's an increasing biological effectiveness of the DNA double strand breaks that are produced. That is because those double strand breaks are beginning more complex and cells find them more and more difficult to repair and hence more and more likely not to survive as a consequence of that radiation exposure. So that's what's happening at the individual cell level. Let's now talk a little bit more about what might be happening at the cell population level and trying to understand from an experimental point of view how we might look at the effects of individual radiation tracks crossing the cell nucleus. Now for charged particles and electrons this is actually quite difficult to do with conventional radiation sources because they produce essentially a stochastic distribution of radiation tracks if you want to look at the effects of a single radiation track crossing an individual cell, the best you can actually do is deliver an average of one particle track per cell, as shown here. And what this means in practice is 37% of the cells actually don't see a track traversal, 37% of the cells see one track traversal, uh, and lesser percentages see more than one track traversal. And it's very difficult from these sorts of distributions to unfold the biological consequences of a single radiation track effect at the level of individual cells. Um, and, but really what we want to do in practice is we want to take a population of cells and individually titrate single radiation tracks into that cell population. And that's under, uh, important for understanding the implications of a single track interacting with those cells, but it's more relevant for when we think of the exposure levels that are related to particularly background levels exposure and occupational limits of exposure. Where if cells get exposed, they get exposed very rarely. Uh, and when they do get exposed, it's highly likely that it's going to be only to a single track traversal. So how do we look at these effects experimentally? Well, this is really what drove the development of microbeam approaches to be able to develop technologies to allow us to do that. What essentially microbeams aim to do is to allow us to uh, look at dose resolution to determine cellular radiation effects down to the ultimate low dose limit of traversal by a single track and to also to, to deliver uh, these in a way that we access spatial resolution that will allow us to resolve tracks, uh, targets and pathways involved in cell tissue effects. So we can take a population of cells and uniformly irradiate each cell with an individual radiation track. We can select out population individual cells and target those. Uh, or if we have the resolution, we can determine where that individual radiation track is going to go, whether it's going to go through the cell nucleus or whether it's going to target another compartment of the cell. So that's really the drivers between trying to develop microbeam approaches. Now, like all things, um, these approaches are by no means new. And in fact, the first microbeam was developed way back in 1912. Uh, by the Russian scientist De Sergi Shakotin, uh, and this was essentially an UV microbeam, essentially using the principles of a microscope uh, to locally uh, irradiate uh, cells on a microscope slide. But this, the uh, importance of this type of approach really became uh, quite uh, well appreciated, and in, in 1957, Ray Zirkel uh, really made the case for why microbeams could be important tools in radiation biology. He really specified that they had two main roles. By selective alteration of various cell parts, it serves as a tool for analysis of the normal cell functions. So a way of mechanistically trying to understand how cells respond to localised irradiation and that they could be a radiobiological tool which yields information about the mechanisms by which radiations produce their striking but imperfectly understood effects on living systems. 
That was what he said back in 1957. And to be honest, uh, a lot of that still rings true today, particularly this phrase imperfectively, imperfectly understood effects on living systems. I can relate to that uh, a lot of the time when some of our research uh, is not clear what, what, what we're actually trying to uh, understand. So most of the modern microbeams are really based on this model here, which was developed by Les Braby, at Pacific uh, uh, Northwest Laboratories uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, which involved taking a beam from an accelerator uh, and uh, collimating that beam into a situation that could be delivered into individual cells uh, under situations where uh, those cells could be visualized with a microscope and imaging uh, technology. In the 90s and 2000s, I was very fortunate to be working at the uh, Grey Cancer Institute in, in London, uh, along with uh, my colleagues, uh, Melvin Folkard, Boris Voinovich and, and Barry Michael. And we've been doing a lot of work trying to understand the effects of low energy charged particles. And it became clear to us that we really needed to start focusing in to look at the impact of low dose exposures. So we very rapidly over a period of years developed a microbeam approach. This also used a collimation approach, essentially using a glass capillary tube, which was actually used for uh, HPLC. This had a one micron bore. It took accelerated particles from our Van de Graaff accelerator. These were collimated. We had a thin scintillator at the exit of that collimator, which emitted a flash of light every time a charged particle went through it. We could detect those with a photomultiplier tube and use that for switching on and off the beam. We had a microscope and imaging system that allowed us to image and locally place individual cells above the exit of the microbeam. This is what the system here they looked like in practice. The beam came through the floor here from the accelerator below. This is our Van de Graaff accelerator uh, with the lid off. Uh, and this is my, my colleagues who were very fortunate to work with back in that time to uh, develop this technology. And this allowed us to really produce single lines with really high uh, reproducibility. This is CR39 track etched plastic, where we delivered individual 3 MeV protons or 3.5 MeV helium ions at precise locations on an array across the plastic. And you can see we can do that with, with pretty good reproducibility. We can control where those particles go in a very reproducible um, uh, way. Now, it's one thing being able to do that in plastic. It's another thing being able to do that in individual live cells. And we were able to do that particularly because at that time, um, the ability to measure individual double strand breaks using fluorescent labeling techniques, either for gamma to H2X or 53 BP1, were rapidly coming into use. And this is what happens when you irradiate an individual human fibroblast with a single 3 MeV helium ion and then stain for gamma H2X. Uh, very quickly after that individual irradiation. You can pick up those individual ions. We can deliver different patterns of ions, either lines going through populations of cells, or we locally place patterns of, uh, of these individual ions within cells. So these microbeams have, have, have tremendous uh, opportunities, and we've done a lot of experiments looking at different patterns of radiation, as have many of the groups uh, uh, that have developed these technologies over the years. Now, they've also been used for looking at radiation carcinogenesis, uh, and this is work from the Columbia Group, uh, uh, headed by David Brenner, using the C3H10 uh, transformation assay. They were able to deliver uh, individual ion, counted ions to many millions of cells that allowed them to start to look at radiation risk at low doses of alpha particle traversals. And they were able to start to compare the differences of delivering exact numbers of counted radiation tracks with those which would be conventionally delivered or Poisson distributed. And you can see here down at the level of a single radiation track, they were starting to pick up significant differences here. So there are differences when you start to meter out these tracks in an individual way. And you can see those differences when you look at the potential uh, for carcinogenesis in these individual uh, transformation assays. So these technologies have a, a lot of uh, importance in terms of being able to uh, assess uh, these effects. 
But at that time, most of what we were doing was really based on the standard so-called DNA target model. It was all related to direct damage to cellular DNA, the production of DNA double strand breaks, and then the cell's ability to repair or not repair those breaks. So if the cell repaired those double strand breaks, it could survive. If those double strand breaks were not repaired, there was a high probability that cell would die. If there was any misrepair of those double strand breaks, there was a high probability of a mutation, which could potentially lead to transformation in the process of carcinogenesis. But along came what are called non-targeted uh, effects. Uh, and these had actually been postulated to be important many years earlier by Douglas uh, Lee. He was a young researcher working in Cambridge who unfortunately died uh, very uh, young. Uh, but he'd done a lot, a lot of work on the standard so-called target theory actions of radiation, which was really based on hitting the DNA and the probability of mutations and chromosome aberrations from that direct uh, radiation exposure. But he postulated uh, way back in 1946 that there could be non-targeted effects, essentially effects that were related to uh, and not strictly localised to where the cell ionisations were actually uh, produced. So this was the so-called non-targeted theory uh, pre pre presented by, by Lee back uh, then. But it was many years later that it really started to become uh, important and the so-called non-targeted effect uh, is well recognised nowadays and many of you will be familiar with that. Not only do we have the direct DNA damage uh, model, but we have other responses that are not directly related to that direct DNA targeting response, so-called genomic instability, effects that may occur many generations after that initial radiation exposure, adaptive responses where if you split radiation dose, there's a memory of that initial exposure. And what I'm going to concentrate a lot on today, the so-called bystander response. So what is a bystander response? Well, essentially, this cell is irradiated here uh, and it's releasing signals that have been detected by its neighbouring cells via what's called a bystander response. So it's when cells respond to their neighbour or neighbours being irradiated. Now, in fact, these had been uh, detected uh, in several seminal experiments in the early 90s by Jack Little and colleagues using conventional low fluence alpha particle exposures. They did radiation exposures in, in the, uh, I think, human fibroblasts, where essentially 100% of the cells were irradiated uh, with alpha particles. And they then reduced the fluence to the level that's such that uh, less than 1% of the cells were likely to see an alpha particle traversal. But interestingly, what they found that when they looked at chromosomal changes in the form of chromatid uh, exchanges, they found uh, that uh, even under exposure levels where very few of the cells were getting exposed, about 30% of the cells were actually showing changes at the level of these chromosome or chromatid uh, aberrations being produced. And they postulated that this was because of, of cell signaling occurring uh, at that time uh, via bystander responses. And then there was other work showing that if you irradiated cells in culture and took the media from those cells, and incubated it in non-exposed cells, that those non-exposed cells uh, responded to that cell culture media. So this is what we call media transfer effects. And particularly the work of uh, Carmel Mollisil and Colin Seymour uh, really mapped out the responses of these. So this is an impact on cell survival. This is cells that have been directly radiated here with increasing radiation dose. And these are cells that have never been directly radiated, but have only ever received the media from irradiated cells. And you can see that their survival drops and then it saturates with increasing dose to the targeted population. And then finally, there was a, a lot of seminal work done by Edward Azam uh, over the years, showing that in conflict fibroblasts and cells that were in very close contact to each other, there could be direct transmittance of signals through what are called gap junctions. So as well as signals being released into the media, direct cell to cell communication plays a role. And you could get activation of DNA damage responses in cells via this bystander response. And if you switched off this connection signaling, you could essentially quench that signaling. 
So over the years, there was a lot of evidence really building up for the uh, potential uh, role of bystander uh, responses. And in fact, when I look today, there's been over 1500 papers uh, trying to describe radiation bystander effects in all the different facets. We came across this with our microbeam uh, in the late 80s. We've been doing some experiments where we had a control region within our microbeam dishes. And one of the things that we were seeing is the level of damaged cells in our control regions seemed to be elevated, even under conditions uh, when those cells were not being irradiated. So we deliberately did an experiment where uh, we irradiated only a single cell within a population of cells. And what we found is that many more cells had damage present in them above that that we would have predicted from only irradiating a single cell in that population. And we were measuring this in the form of chromosome aberrations, either in the production of micronuclei or heavily fragmented chromosomal aberrations. And in fact, what we found, there was a very distinct dose response uh, relationship here. If you took a single cell within a dish of cells and irradiated it with uh, three MeV helium ions, in this case, with increasing numbers of particles, a delivered to that a single cell, there was an elevation in the level of damaged cells in the population, and then there was a saturation. Very typical of what we see with bystander responses. And many other uh, groups with microbeams uh, did similar types of experiments. This again is the Columbia group, uh, looking at low dose alpha particle exposures, increasing number of alpha particle exposures, either to every cell in the population or to only 10% in the population. And what you can see at the level of a single particle, there's an elevation in the number of damaged uh, cells uh, that you get under these conditions. In this case, it's looking at uh, carcinogenesis output, and that saturates with increasing uh, radiation dose. So there's some standard similarities here between the way that these bystander responses uh, are uh, observed, particularly when it comes to the dose response relationship. In contrast to what we get with direct effect, but generally what you see is increasing effect with increasing dose. With bystander effects, you seem to see this low dose sensitivity, the activation of them, and then they saturate high doses. And this generated a lot of interest because these effects appeared to predominate at low doses. They were observed in a range of cell types for a range of different endpoints, and there appeared to be uh, a, uh, several distinct mechanisms involved in their production. And in fact, over the years, we've been able to really pick out some of the molecular mechanisms that drive these responses. The production of free radicals in the form of reactive oxygen or reactive nitrogen species, the activation of cytokine signaling, and the production of inflammatory responses in immune responses. Uh, and we're very, very uh, slowly nowadays really getting a complete uh, map of how these responses work at the cellular level. So are these responses predominantly delivered by direct DNA damage to the nucleus? Well, obviously this again is a question that a microbeam can relatively easily answer. We can take cells, look at them down the microscope and ask our microbeam, rather than targeting the cell nucleus, to deliberately target regions within the cell uh, a cytoplasm. Uh, and this is an experiment that we did where we uh, took uh, individual uh, human fibroblasts and radiated them either through the nucleus or nine microns away from the nucleus in the cytoplasm and scored DMA damage, in this case in the form of micronuclei, 40 hours uh, later. If you directly irradiate these cells through the nucleus, you get a significant uh, DNA damage uh, response. And you also get a bystander response after that nuclear uh, irradiation. Um, even three hours after that radiation exposure. If you do the same experiment, but irradiate through the cytoplasm, you get a, a response in those directly irradiated cytoplasmic cells, even though those cells haven't been directly irradiated through the nucleus. The response is less than direct response uh, through the nucleus, but nevertheless, it's a response to that direct cytoplasmic uh, exposure. And critically, in neighbouring bystander effects, after that cytoplasmic exposure, you also see a bystander response. And the bystander response you get, in fact, is very similar to what you get after nuclear exposure. Uh, 
So the level of bystander effect here appears to be independent as to whether that dose is delivered to the nucleus or delivered to the cytoplasm. And in fact, you can try and understand a little bit about the mechanisms that are driving this. Uh, free radical production in the form of reactive oxygen species appears to be involved because if you add in a free radical scavenger, in this case uh, dimethyl sulfoxide, you can quench these effects. And it's the membrane signaling going on in the bystander cells appears to be important. If you quench that or inhibit that by using a drug called philippin, you can essentially switch off that bystander effect. Um, so, and other studies have shown uh, that mitochondria actually play an important role here. You can also see this at the level of the production of mutations. This again is work from the Columbia group uh, where they compare the effect uh, in a mutation assay of delivering uh, the counted uh, alpha particles directly through the nucleus or directly through the cytoplasm. And even after cytoplasmic irradiation, there was the observation of mutations produced in these cells, albeit at a lower level than what you get from direct nuclear radiation. So all in all, this tells us that uh, cells respond to radiation, they respond to direct irradiation through the nucleus, but they also respond to direct radiation through the cytoplasm. This appears to involve the production of free radicals, reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species. It involves mitochondrial uh, participation, and these are key producing agents of uh, free radicals within cells. And that leads to the production of bystander, bystander signals. And these bystander signals, either from nuclear or cytoplasmic irradiation, can lead to a DNA damage response in neighboring bystander response uh, cells. So as well as the direct targeted effect here, we have these non-targeted effects, uh, independent of whether that dose is delivered to the nucleus or the cytoplasm. So now let's a little, uh, a little bit of uh, discussion about spatial distributions at the tissue level. We need to understand not the, only the effects of, of localized irradiation at individual cells, but what happens when we have different cell types present in a tissue. And clearly you can do that using model systems and the model system that was initially used for a lot of this work was the 3D human skin reconstruct model. You can take uh, primary skin fibroblasts, plate them out in a, a collagen matrix and they'll slowly form a 3D structure uh, that essentially mimics human skin. And the Columbia group essentially took these 3D human uh, constructs and delivered essentially a line of individual alpha particle tracks down through a, th a section of these 3D constructs and then interrogated different levels of those constructs to look for the presence of a signal or a bystander response in those constructs. And essentially what they found at different distances away from the radiated plane, they could see the production of apoptotic and damaged chromosomal or micronucleated cells. And essentially they showed that after the localized irradiation, these signals could propagate uh, up to one millimeter within tissue uh, within a relatively short period of time. Now that was all well and good in a 3D model uh, system. Are these effects observed uh, in vivo? Uh, and in fact, they are. This is in vivo studies uh, in a rat lung model where the rat lung has been partially shielded with lead shielding and the lower half of lungs of the lungs has been irradiated. In this case, quite a high dose of 10 gray single exposure. And what you see is not only do you see damaged cells being produced in the lower exposed part of the lung, but you also see damaged cells being produced in the shielded part of the lung. And in other studies it was shown that there was a lot of cytokine signaling going on between the irradiated and the non-irradiated part of these lungs as part of this localized exposure. These um, effects also play a role in carcinogenesis. Uh, this is work Again, not using a microbeam, but using a lead shielding approach in a radiosensitive mouse model. This is the patch uh, one mutant model, which is predisposed to medulloblastoma and skin tumors. And if you take these mice and shield uh, the head region uh, and uh, locally irradiate uh, the tail region of the mouse and compare that with whole body exposures, you get significant induction of medulloblastoma in these mice even when you've partially shielded the head region of the mouse. 
Uh, and this is different to what you get if you compare it with the same scattered radiation dose at the whole body level. So induction of uh, carcinogenesis process uh, under these shielded conditions. And as part of this, they looked at the mechanisms that were driving this and what they found uh, in the cerebellum of these mice. They found the production of damaged uh, cells. But after that damaged cells uh, were removed, there was a compensatory hyperplasia going on. So essentially a homostatic mechanism driving changes in the non-exposed medulloblastoma after this by long range bystander effect was being produced. Now, these long range bystander effects also raise some comparisons which what, with what were called abscopal responses. Now, these were responses that are being observed in patients undergoing localised radiotherapy, where there was some observation that metastatic sites that weren't in the radiation field appeared to be responding even after that localised radiation at a distant site. And these were termed uh, long range or abscopal effects. Uh, and uh, they were seen uh, rather infrequently in, in various clinical studies. But in fact, they had been predicted many years earlier to be an important potential consequences of radiation exposure by Ro Robin Mole. And he defined uh, an abscopal effect as not the effect of an object of a radiation on its localised environment, but at a distance from the radiated volume, but within the same organism. And there's been a lot of work done in these, particularly in the impact of these abscopal effects in the situation where tumours are present in the body. And if you radiate a primary tumour, in this case in a mouse model, you can see effects of that localised irradiation in a secondary tumour at distances away from that primary irradiation. And there's been a lot of studies suggesting that underpinning this is an important role uh, for the immune response. So that's what I'll finish off uh, uh, now is just saying a little bit about the immune response and its likely role in long range bystander abscopal effects. And from radiation exposed populations, there's a lot of studies out there suggesting that there are immunological changes that occur even after low dose exposures. There's a very uh, interesting recent review by Leminski and colleagues, which have reviewed a lot of the data that's out there from the atomic bomb uh, survivors, nuclear workers, uh, and various other exposure uh, scenarios. And essentially what they find is that even after low dose exposures, there's evidence out there that immune changes occur in the human body on radiation uh, dose, uh, but nevertheless, an important role for the immune response uh, related to inflammatory uh, processes likely to play a role here. And this is now becoming important in our understanding of the potential role of bystander responses, the role in a localised setting, and also the likely consequences for that for more longer range distant responses and the production of abscopal effects. A lot of the work that's been done in this area at the moment is really in the process of cancer therapy and the potential impact of these and abscopal effects, but they're also likely to have a role uh, in the case of the normal tissue responses uh, as well. So where does this uh, leave us in terms of bystander signaling? Well, really, when we want to consider bystander effects, we need really to consider them under three distinct scenarios. There's a so-called microbeam scenario of localised irradiation of an individual cell within a population of cells. And that's really the scenario that might be relevant to, for example, background radiation exposures, where if a cell receives a radiation dose, it's only likely ever to see a single radiation track. And microbeams play an important role for trying to titrate the responses of that. Then the so-called abscopal effects, which are much more longer range effects, where a radiation of an individual tissue leads to consequences for a, another tissue uh, somewhat distant away from that. And this might be of relevance to, for example, radiotherapy to a localised tumour, uh, an exposure where you have physical contact with a, a small radioactive source and also has relevance to radionuclide exposures. And something I've not really discussed today, but it's actually where we're doing a lot of work at the mo moment, are so-called cohort effects. Essentially where you have dose gradients across tissues or tumours, 
where those cells will start to single signal with each other mm -hmm. because of differences in the dose responses that they're likely to be receiving. And that might be of, of relevance to the sorts of situations you get when uh, you get CT scans into the body. They're of relevance to various advanced radiotherapy uh, scenarios, and they may be of consequence to some radiation and exposure accidents and incidents, particularly those uh, at the more high dose end of this. So we're really now classifying bystander non-target effects into these three distinct uh, categories, uh, depending on the differences of the exposures at the spatial level. So I think I'm coming up to um, the end of my time, so maybe I'll just summarise what I've, I've covered uh, today. So microbeams are useful tools for assessing biological mechanisms of low dose exposures. I've shown you some of the work that's been delivered by single ion microbeams, but there are a whole range of different microbeam sources out there that deliver patterned radiation exposures, particularly of relevance to more advanced radiotherapy treatments at the moment. But that approach of localising dose has tremendous uh, power associated with it for trying to understand the consequences of spatial distribution at the cellular and tissue levels. We now understand that bystander and abscopal effects are interlinked non-targeted processes. These don't fit the standard DNA damage model, but they're all related to cell signaling and tissue signaling effects. And understanding the temporal and spatial distribution of radiation dose and cellular tissue effect is really becoming more and more important. It's becoming important for understanding consequences of uh, radiation risk, but also it's becoming very important for advanced radiotherapy, where nowadays more and more complex modulated beams are delivered to patients. And really what we're moving into is a phase where rather of thinking about radiation as a direct damaging agent, we're now thinking about the systemic consequences of radiation exposure. What is likely to occur outside that cell and outside that tissue after a direct radiation exposure, particularly now as we're starting to look at the implications of involvement, for example, of the immune response and inflammatory response. But underpinning this, we don't really know, we don't really want to be throwing the baby out of the bath with water. Key to the way that radiation works is direct effects. You have to have a radiation track, it has to interact with the cell at a target, direct DNA damage does play an important role, but there's also these systemic consequences of that radiation, uh, localised radiation uh, damage to the cell nucleus and the DNA that we need to take into account. Okay, so I'd like to finish in by really acknowledging uh, a lot of the people who uh, I'm currently collaborating with and involved with, particularly uh, the group here at the Johnson uh, Cancer Centre and my colleagues in medical physics and radiation oncology in the Northern Ireland Cancer Centre. Uh, I do a lot of work with the National Physical Laboratory in Teddington, particularly my uh, colleague Giuseppe Schettino, and, and really also to acknowledge uh, the, 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 the really tremendous uh, time I had previously at the Grey Cancer Institute and my colleagues Barry Michael, Melvin Folkard and Boris Voinovich, who really developed all our fundamental uh, ideas and approaches for looking at bystander responses uh, with the uh, single cell microbeams. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, some of the current funders of our work. Thank you. Thank you for um, the wonderful presentation. Professor Price, um, we do have some questions. Um, so um, if you do have a question, um, as I mentioned at the start of the webinar, feel free to type it in. Um, the first question is um, from Gabriel and uh, Professor Price, I'll encourage you to take a look at it too, as it's a long one, but I will read it out so everyone can hear. In the context of targeted cytoplasm, irradiation, is there evidence of specific species inducing DNA damage considering the necessity of these species to diffuse in the nucleus? On one hand, it cannot be hydroxyl radicals because they do not diffuse. On the other hand, hydrogen peroxide does diffuse this, diffuse but is quite unreactive in the absence of transition metals. So what would be the underlying mechanism? Well, you're very right, Gabriel. A lot, a lot of the reactive species that get produced are very short lived. So they're, they're not the be all and ends all of what's happening here. We know, for example, that uh, uh, cytokines play an important role here, at least in the intercellular 
uh, interaction space. And of course, cytokines can lead downstream to the activation of localized uh, effects. Some of this may also be uh, directly related to increased turnover and release of reactive oxygen species from mitochondria. We have a good bit of evidence suggesting that mitochondria play a key role here. If you target cells where you've deliberately removed mitochondria, you don't see any um, a indirect DNA damage being produced and you don't see activation of a bystander response. So mitochondria may in fact be direct targets of that cytoplasmic irradiation. They are generally sources of reactive oxygen species because they tend to be very leaky. Uh, so that might be a crit critical player here. But yes, you're right. A, a lot of the species that, that are likely to cause damage here are relatively short lived. Thank you. The next question. Um, have you or others examined whether extracellular vesicle release is involved in bystander effects, um, either hit cell to bystander cell or vice versa? If so, are mitochondrial vesicles found in the extracellular vesicles? So the, there's a lot of work, um, nice work being done, particularly by Medina Kadims and colleagues, uh, looking at the role of exosomes. Uh, and exosomes are, are extracellular vesicles. Um, membrane bound extracellular vesicles and critically they can carry a whole range of different payloads including cytokines and various other reactive uh, species uh, and there's good evidence showing that they may be some of the critical payloads that deliver uh, signals from irradiated to non-irradiated cells. So these get sloughed off internally and sloughed off externally from cells and then can uh, transmit through the blood supply, for example, and interact uh, with neighbouring or, or, or dis distant cells to produce effects. So there is a lot of good evidence out there for an important role of exosomes. Um, so the next question, you talked mostly about implications for cancer. Do you think that bystander and Abscopal effects may have a role to play in non-cancer effects such as cardiovascular disease. Yeah, so this this is all related to implications for normal tissue damage. And uh, uh, there's been a little bit of work done looking at this, not necessarily in cardiovascular uh, disease. And what seems to happen is, is what's critical here is uh, the way that normal tissue homeostatic mechanisms work and particularly the important role of stem cells in maintaining homeostatic uh, normality of, of, of tissues. And there's some evidence that uh, stem cells may play an important role here in terms of propagation and the, and the mitigation of uh, bystander responses. But really we've got a long way to go to try and enter the potential role of these uh, for um, producing, uh, for example, cardiovascular effects uh, outside uh, the targeted area. Uh, my colleagues here are, are looking at that in vivo using um, focused uh, uh, small animal radiation platforms, particularly looking at the role of uh, a thoracic exposures uh, on a heart damage and trying to understand radiosensitivity not only within the heart but within the lung and differential responses between that. Uh, and we do have some evidence suggesting that there may be uh, non-targeted effects occurring there, but we've got a long way to go to try and uh, understand some of those. Thank you. Um, the next question, with all of this research and work into bystander non-targeted effects, um, do we have enough information or knowledge to potentially trick the system in a beneficial way? Somehow use very low dose radiation to try and promote some kind of a hormetic response in neighboring cells or is something like that years away from being achieved? So, so there's been a lot of interest over the years in hormetic responses or adaptive responses. And, you know, for adaptive responses, basically the idea is a small dose of radiation primes the system uh, in some way to remember that small priming dose and then mitigate the consequences uh, of a second larger dose. So probably wrapped into that is some signaling going on there in terms of the likely consequences uh, of uh, that. How that relates to bystander responses and how that sits generally within the, the non-targeted space. There has been some work trying to look at the, uh, the similarities between adaptive responses and bystander responses. There is some evidence suggesting 
that in sales where you see adaptive responses, you may also see bystander responses uh, as well. But we've still got a long way to go to try and understand that, particularly at the tissue level. Uh, but there could be some some uh, interesting uh, interactions uh, there. Thank you. Um, next question. How do you explain genomic instability? Yeah, so uh, I'm not an expert in genomic instability, but but really it, it, in some way it's uh, it's uh, the cell remembering the fact that it's been exposed and continuing to remember that through subsequent uh, generations. And there's some evidence suggesting that genomic instability may actually be delivered, generally driven by bystander responses. It's part of that that a signaling uh, cascade that may occur after localized uh, irradiation. It's not necessarily the direct cell itself, but it's neighboring cells that are receiving bystander responses uh, as well. And again, some work suggesting that cells that 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 the uh, cell types that show genomic instability may also be more prone to responses to bystander uh, signaling. Uh, but really, we, we still don't know the, 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 the real interactions with those. There is evidence suggesting that inflammatory responses, reactive function species, those types of things play a role in genomic instability, also play a role in bystander responses. So some commonality there in terms of uh, uh, mechanisms as well. OK, um, we have lots of questions. <laughs> a few minutes left, but um, we'll, we'll try and sneak in a few more. The next question is, um, after all the results on single particle effects, does it make any sense to talk about dose anymore? Well, this is a very um, interesting question. Um, and who's somebody, somebody who used to work at the Gray Cancer Institute, named after Hal Gray. Um, it, it's always a, an interesting one to consider. Uh, and dose does break down when you start to consider radiation tracts individually within cells and tissues and the biological consequences of that. And I think we are starting to lean towards thinking about more biologically relevant dosimetry terms that could be potentially used. But we're a long way from, from, from getting to there and certainly uh, something that uh, ICRP and these sorts of bodies shouldn't be too worried about uh, yet. But as a, a radiation biologist, we're certainly trying to, to look at other potential measures uh, of biologically relevant dose uh, that we need to be using here rather than the conventional um, a, um, a, a, a units of grey, for example. OK, thank you. Um, I think we might be able to squeeze a couple more in. Um, the next one is, what would you say about the role of non-targeted effects for the new spatially fractionated radiotherapy regimen, regimens? Sorry. So th this is what I'm spending a lot of my time on at the moment, is, is looking at the uh, dose gradients and different fractionation patterns that are currently being used or about to be used clinically. More and more, the delivery of clinical radiotherapy is moving away from uniform exposures to much more use of patterned radiation exposures. And that's been driven by observations suggesting under these conditions, you get protection of normal tissue. Uh, they seem to be able to respond to patterned radiations much more in a beneficial way than tumours. Uh, and this has been driven by, uh, for example, old work that's been done using what are called grid uh, radiotherapy approaches, which were used to debulk tumours, large tumours. They delivered high radiation doses, but using large apertures, and those are spared normal tissue from that response. And you can scale all that down to them, essentially the micron level, and see the same impact of that enhanced killing of tumours, but a uh, protection of normal tissues. And all of that protection of normal tissues we think has been driven by bystander responses in normal tissues and the ability of those normal tissue stem cells to respond and re-proliferate and essentially heal normal tissues after these spatially delivered radiation doses. And there's good evidence that uh, in normal tissues and in tumours, if you deliver dose gradients, so you see the production of bystander responses. So they do, non-targeted effects, play an important role at the clinical end uh, when you deliver radiotherapy in a spatially constrained way. Okay, thank you. Um, I promised, I had promised two more, so final question. <laughs> Um, is there any evidence for the involvement of the epigenome uh, in these non-targeted responses to ionizing radiation, particularly at low doses? 
So there's certainly been work looking at gene expression profiles in direct and bystander cells, uh, particularly work of Sally Amundsen and colleagues at uh, um, Columbia. And you do see differences there and directly irradiated cells. As you can imagine, things are driven by the P53 signaling axis, whereas in bystander cells, it appears to be more NF kappa beta and inflammatory type gene expression responses that you tend to get there. So there are differences at the gene expression uh, level when you look at the impact of, of, of single ions. Uh, so that may propagate through uh, uh, even into the low dose uh, region. Uh, we don't really know there, but certainly there's experimental studies that have shown some gene expression changes uh, under uh, conditions where microbeams have been used for testing that. Okay, wonderful. I think we've hit our um, our time. Edward, I'll, I'll just pass it back over to you to close this out if that's okay. Thank you very much, Kevin, for really an inspirational webinar that we get so many, so many thoughts for future research. And on behalf of everyone at CNL, we extend our gratitude to you and to the audience for their participation and the wonderful questions that they have, that they have asked. So thank you very much. And uh, we hope we will all meet again for our next uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, you, Edward. It's been, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much. And thank you all thank for the you. great questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye, just now.